I'm Eric Wielander, welcome back to my channel. So one of the most common questions I get from you guys is some scenario of you're about to set up your dream new smart home, whether you're buying a house, building a house, buying or renting an apartment, anything in between, and you have a list of gear that you've either gotten or about to get, and you're kind of just trying to figure out what to do to set up your new smart home for success. And of course, I'm a YouTuber where I see a lot of the latest and greatest products and have kind of a pulse on what's coming or what's new in the industry. But at the same time, I'm not setting up new smart homes all the time and seeing a lot of different people's setups. So one of the friends of the channel who you might have seen in the comments and other places, Robert Spivak, is a professional smart home consultant. So he works with people both in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also remotely across the world with all kinds of new smart home setups. So this is not sponsored by him or anything. This is just me sitting down and talking with one of our mutual friends out here in the community about what to do for setting up a new smart home. This is definitely gonna be a video I'm gonna be referencing in the future, but whether you're getting ready to move into your next new smart home right away, or this is just a dream about something coming off in the future, stay tuned because you're in for a really good conversation. I, I try to span the space between completely do-it-yourself DIY and the very high end of custom integration. It's an area that in the industry we've started to call do it for me. So everything I do, you could do on your own. There are no secret codes or passwords or magic software you're not allowed to have, but I save people the time and effort and I help them plan out a larger installation with a multitude of devices to have everything work smoothly. One of the topics as we were talking about this before this video that you uh, mentioned is, is one of the early things to consider is wiring, maybe even before you move into the place. What are some things to think about in terms of, in terms of putting wiring in your home? Sure, the, the overall consideration is you can't go back and wire easily later, it's much more expensive. So if you're building a new home or you're doing major reconstruction on a home you've built or remodeling, I like to put a lot of attention into thinking through where you might need wires and even perhaps putting them in if you're not gonna use them right away, but so they're there for you. A lot of the details get overlooked. I mean, basically the premise is wires are better than wireless, even today, with incredibly good wireless mesh, Wi-Fi, whatever doesn't move, it would be ideal to hardwire it. So TVs, streaming media, speakers, security systems, uh, security cameras. Yeah, and, and with that, Ethernet plays a key role in terms of the networking backbone for a lot of that stuff. These days, are you, in, are you seeing CAT6 as the traditional standard installed, or what's the latest as far as uh, Ethernet standards for putting into the wall? There are There's a lot of discussion on standards, but essentially the go-to wire to use is CAT6 or CAT6A. There are standards or pseudo standards beyond that. You may hear CAT7, CAT8, but really none of those higher level standards are either suitable for home use or truly standard. If you're going to go beyond CAT6A, I would suggest looking at fiber optic, although that might be overkill, but in some areas like a, an overhead projector for, for audio video, you might wanna run a short fiber drop within the room rather than throughout the whole house to handle the HDMI alternative because running the right HDMI cable is actually a bigger challenge than Ethernet. Everyone that installed a projector with a 1080p HDMI cable five years ago now has to worry about 4K upgrades or 8K upgrades down the road. So I like to plan for the future and I recommend at least one Ethernet cable to every room, but finesse it more if you look at a bedroom or a work study utility room, you may want one ethernet drop near where the headboard of the bed will be and another drop on the other side of the room where your desk or TV will be. It just saves ending up with wires snaking along the floor or taped under a rug. Now, I totally understand it's not free, 
But there's a saying we have in the industry, the most expensive wire is the one you don't run. So a few years later, when you're cutting into the walls or drilling or finding out you can't do it, it's extremely expensive. So I advise my clients to spend more of their budget on wiring and buy dirt cheap network gear and Wi-Fi gear because human nature being what it is, in a couple of years or less, you're gonna replace all that Wi-Fi equipment for the latest and greatest. But the wires you put in will last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So plan accordingly that way. That's really great advice. Once you get some of that wiring thought about or taken care of, is maybe the next priority thing on the list is, is to think about equipment in different rooms and the locations. And some of that equipment might be easier to install before you actually move in or while you're potentially building a home or whatnot. What are what are some of these things to, to think about as far as, I mean, we talked about HDMI projectors and TVs. What goes into thinking about even just those details? of where those go in the home. One of the things you want to look at is most contractors will typically install a shallow, thin box in the master bedroom closet or in the garage, and it's where they expect you to put all your equipment. It's really not that well suited for network switches, uh, even AV equipment. So folks will look for one place to put a cabinet or a shelving, but often your physical equipment location may not match how you use it. So think about clusters. You may have your network cluster, and then you may have small AV clusters. And if you have a multi-floor home, you may want to have one network distribution cluster per floor. When I say cluster, it could be just a two foot by four foot small shelf or enclosed rack, not a giant freestanding equipment cabinet. So if you plan out where you put this clustering of equipment, you may run r less wiring. You don't have to run wire from the third floor all the way down to the basement. You run and fan out the wires on each floor and then just interconnect the floors vertically, for example. Have you had any experience, uh, Robert, with any of the, the whole home water management systems like Mo and Flow? Is that, is that something you've seen people use at all yet? I've seen some interest in more of the shutoff valves that are cut right into the main water line rather than just leak detectors. So it actually has to be installed by a plumber. Typically on the smart home side, the requirement there is good Wi-Fi in an unexpected location, like a corner of your garage or the, the outside entry point. So as you after you look at the general network foundation, you wanna look at where you may have a cluster of Wi-Fi gear, for example, irrigation controller in the garage, lights, garage door opener, uh, perhaps you have outdoor lighting or you want Wi-Fi in your backyard or your patio so you can work outside. So those may be areas, again, where you need to put extra Wi-Fi equipment. And that leads us into another topic that I wanted to touch on here, which is different home automation systems and voice control. I think you have some really interesting ideas about how those may or may not play together for different customers you've worked with in the past. So Now, of course, it depends whether you're growing up from buying a few different products that you like and then trying to make them all work together, or whether you're starting with a clean sheet of paper wanting the ideal setup. So I recommend that if you can, to choose one primary ecosystem. Apple HomeKit is certainly the choice of most Apple users, but the other systems are Google Home, Amazon Alexa, other DIY automation controllers like Habitat, and a few others. So if you can pick a primary system and then everything ideally will be designed first to work with that and then layer in additional islands where necessary. And by that I mean there may be a, a specialized water controller like you mentioned that doesn't really work well in any of these ecosystems but it has its own app. So you can make an exception there and say I will use a few apps it's sort of interesting, the, 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 the holy grail of everything being controlled by one system, that can be done, but at what price? You can do that if you want to buy a $50,000 or $100,000 incredibly custom system, but if you want 80% of everything to run in an ecosystem, you can do it with HomeKit or you can do it with uh, Google or Alexa. It's that last 10% that costs the most. So if you're willing to live with five apps and not 50, you can get a lot closer to that. And along those lines, I think what you're hinting at is voice. 
I like to view voice control as another layer. So I choose the primary control system based on automations, physical capability. Do you have buttons? Do you have switches? Do you have easy controls that you can use? App control. And then lastly, the voice solution might not be part of the main system. So I've seen folks use Apple HomeKit primarily, but they prefer Amazon Alexis for the voice aspect of it because they put a $40, $50, or even $20 device in every room, and they can walk into any room and easily control the lights with their voice. Whereas, especially originally with a $400 HomePod, you're not gonna put one of those in every room. Now with the HomePod minis, it's a lot easier, but it's still $99. So there's always a cost to being tightly integrated, and there's a trade-off. There are other voice systems, Google Voice, will work with Apple devices, and there are some other third-party systems. But I'd actually say the best voice solutions right now are very specialized. The interesting phenomenon lately is the voice remotes for Apple TV are really good at just controlling your entertainment, and the voice option in even a Comcast Xfinity TV is actually quite good. The biggest objection I have to a lot of these bigger, fancier systems is that the actual manufacturer provided gear is 80% of the solution for zero cost. With maybe living in a mixed home where you might use, let's say, Amazon for voice assistant and Apple for HomeKit and main automation control, uh, how are you or what tips do you recommend for keeping all of that data in sync so that your rooms are the same in both and maybe you have similar named scenes or routines across both? Are there any shortcuts to that or you just got to go in and put in the work manually and configure it? Good choices up front can make it simpler. For example, Lutron's lighting control system, which I am a big advocate for as you are a bit, also has an automated sync. So if you are careful in how you use it, the room names and the device names will automatically synchronize between HomeKit and Lutron's app. And there are a few things you can do in Lutron's app you can't do in HomeKit, so you may not completely control it only from HomeKit. Also, Philips Hue has some synchronization capabilities and a few other apps do. For others, the best secret weapon is a notebook. By that I mean documenting whether you use software or whether you use pen and paper, creating a naming system that's consistent, creating some conventions and sitting back and naming everything. You'll find out there are certain names that Siri and HomeKit don't like, certain names that Amazon doesn't like. So if you do a nice Venn diagram and keep things simple. One of the things that I like to do in setups for non-computer techie experts is I set up Amazon or Siri so you go into any room and there's only one command you know how to say, lights on or lights off. And because the device is a member of a group in that room, the lights in that room go on or off. You don't have to know the names of all the different lights. And you can go to any room in the house and get the expected behavior. So you're not using a lot of advanced voice commands, but 80-20 rule, what you use all the time, you don't have to think about it, it works almost automatically. We were talking about Ethernet earlier. When you start putting one or two jacks in every single room in a home, even with a smaller home, you're starting to talk about a lot of different hardwired accessories. With something like a standard consumer Wi-Fi router, let's say one from Eero, do you find those are able to handle that many Ethernet connections or does someone need to look at maybe something like a Ubiquiti or more, more advanced networking setup for uh, that many Ethernet connections? Again, it really varies with your configuration. I I do recommend if you're using something like an Eero mesh or an Orbi that you try to hardwire the units together. So one of the ethernet ports coming out of the unit all go back to the central wiring area. In, in networking lingo, that's called a backhaul connection, a wired backhaul. So each unit is not meshing. Actually, it's not interconnecting with all the others. That's gonna give you the maximum speed. If you do that, then each unit can support four or five or six devices easily. The only limitation will be the physical ports because most of these Wi-Fi devices have one or two ports on the back. So you can buy an ethernet switch. A gigabit speed switch is, a simple switch is 10, 20, $30. So 
Um, I wouldn't worry about running out of ports, just plan on buying a little switch to expand it. If you do upgrade your network to a Unify or other more prosumer level, then again, the purists say every Ethernet wire should go back to the main closet and you should have a 24, 48, or 100 port big switch. But I believe in a two layer network is fine. You're not running, you know, a thousand computer network here. So in each room, I run at least one Ethernet. And from that Ethernet, I plug a small tabletop eight or 10 port switch. So you fan out. Think of it like, although it's totally different technology, think of it like a multi plug extension cord. So as long as you've got one Ethernet jack in every room, you've got the most important thing covered. If you run out of ports, just plug in a four or eight or 16 port ethernet, put it in your desk, put it on a shelf, put it behind a cabinet, and then you have as many ports as you need. I've talked a lot on this channel in the past about how much I love Lutron and use them for lighting and I installed some of their shades in my home and I've had really reliable experience with their products. And you and I have talked offline in the past and I've, I've heard you talk about what makes Lutron so reliable. And maybe if you can elaborate on at least what we know as outside observers with not much you know inside info from Lutron on that. What I I found with Lutron is the most important aspects is they are a lighting company, not a computer company. Their history is their family owned business. Um, the founder recently passed away, but some family members are still involved in running the company. It's privately held. So financially, they're not looking for quarterly results just to please investors. And actually, surprisingly, I learned when I first got involved with them, the founder of Lutron invented the modern dimmer. They have more experience and knowledge in dimming and the reality of bulbs that don't dim or that buzz when they dim or if, if you dim them low, they don't turn off, there's a slight glow. So their technology, they put all of their effort into lighting and lighting control and they added the computer aspects later. Most of the other companies, especially the new brands, they are computer guys, they're app guys, they're software guys, they hire a hardware guy and they put together a dimmer and they don't have that deep, deep expertise. And where I see that is I walk into homes and there are Lutron systems that are 20 years old or older and they've been working and working forever. They're just very reliable. They're almost as reliable as electricity in the wall. They're not like a computer. I mean, I had the discussion the other day with somebody, oh yeah, every microprocessor system, everything, you gotta reboot it once a week or once a day, it's normal. And I said, well, yes, but I've had Lutron processors, which is what they call the main controller, the little box, that haven't rebooted in two years except for when the power went out in the house. It's just a different mentality. And that has pervaded the product design so everything has a physical control. You can buy all Lutron gear, put in all your dimmers and never hook it up as an electronic control system and all the lights work. You can't do that with a, a lot of other systems. Something doesn't work right unless you've programmed it or turned on the controllers or loaded the software. So the fallback mode of Lutron is it just works as a dimmer and as a light even if everything else isn't working. If your internet is out, if your Wi-Fi is out, your network is out. And they took a very conservative approach on the technology side in their wireless controls, which are the Caseta and the RAW2 Select and the RAW2 system. They used their own system, which isn't a mesh. They call it Clear Connect Type A now. They renamed it. And it uses a, a centralized system. There's one main transmitter or repeater and all the stations talk to it. And they used a lower frequency, a 400 megahertz frequency range, much lower than Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or others. So there's no frequency band interference, but lower frequency is slower speed, but longer reach. And they don't have the speed to do video or other general computer things, but remember light you send a little command on or off and then nothing forever, basically. So their controls work over a much larger distance and much more reliably. So I guess it wouldn't be a video on my channel if we didn't at least touch on Thread and what makes Thread so great and why I'm so excited about Thread coming more and more to the smart home. What are 
your thoughts on Thread? Are you excited about it? And, and where do you really see it being a valuable part of people's smart homes? I see Thread as Apple admitting that Bluetooth failed. Bluetooth is great for audio. It's great for ears. It's great for headphones. It's great for speakers on a short distance, but it's terrible for home automation because it doesn't have the range and the efforts to create a Bluetooth mesh standard and have it supported is just realistically never happened. So Bluetooth is a failure for home automation devices, for window sensors, door sensors, leak sensors, or an alternative to other wireless. So I strongly welcome Thread because it provides finally a low power wireless radio for all those devices that isn't Bluetooth or isn't the higher power, more complicated Wi-Fi in that regard. So even at that level, it's great. The benefit of Thread is it's truly multi-vendor and multi-platform, so we may see it as, along with Ethernet and Wi-Fi, is the top three physical transports that will unite everything at a physical level. So any device with Thread or Wi-Fi or Ethernet ultimately should be able to communicate with all the smart home systems if the appropriate bridges and software fall into place. Thread itself seems to be a lot faster more responsive and the meshing of thread allows it to have the distance and range problem solved. So I think thread will be the de facto low power wireless technology for most smart homes and we'll see where it goes from there. You're a professional that's helping uh, people set up their smart home in various capacities depending on maybe the client. Uh, when would you recommend sort of drawing the line at maybe you should talk to a professional like yourself versus when you could probably do it yourself? Like what, what are some of the things to think about there? I don't want this to sound like advertising, but one of the things that I do is I consult with people just remotely and answer all their questions and guide them in their own path of DIY installation. So for a lot of people, they're not paying for me to do anything they can't do. So if they don't want to spend three weeks trying to get a doorbell installed and they just want to say, do it for me and either do it or it works or it doesn't, then they might want to hire somebody. And that's the do it for me concept. You can do it yourself. And when I'm done, you get the passwords, you get all the knowledge. Some people want to be trained. They say, I want to do it, but can you teach me how? So early on in my career, I looked at the big expensive systems and I got very frustrated because the tools were not available. They don't give you the software unless you're an authorized dealer. They don't let you change anything. They have password protection on everything. And I thought, well, if I can help people. So I tried helping a few people just install simple products. And what I learned is they didn't need my help, but they needed the knowledge. So I made a decision early on that if someone needs the knowledge but doesn't want to pay me to do the work, they're never going to be my customer. And that's a good thing because I don't mind explaining things to them or sharing some of the tips because it's not that they're going to take that information and then cut me out of work. They, if they want, don't want to do it themselves, they want help, they'll look for someone like me or other professionals, or if they want a, a very big system for a large house or multiple properties, then they'll just say, just do it all. I don't want to know the details. But in that middle ground of do it yourself or do it for me, I bridge the gap with as little or as much help. For some people, they send me their architectural floor plans and I help them figure out where to put Wi-Fi access points or how many wires to put in that I never hear from them again. Others might say, I want you to help me pick the right equipment or how do I choose between these three brands of Wi-Fi gear? So in general, I would say choose where you want help and find the type of person or company that will help you at your level with as little or as much help as you want. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. I'm not a contractor that adds 30% to everything and hires a crew and, and you've just paid through the nose. But I don't provide the lowest cost option and that's intentional. I focus on what I can do well and work with other professionals who specialize in what they do. 
So let's say you, Robert, won the lottery tomorrow and you decided not to do any more work in smart home installations, but you wanted to build a big mansion somewhere and hire an installer to do it for you and set a lot of this stuff up. What things would you come with as far as information to someone like yourself and or let's say electricians or other types of specialties that you might hire for doing that kind of a job? First is I would hire a lighting designer, an interior designer, and an architect. Because ultimately, a lot of what I work with, it's the aesthetics that are equal or much more important than the technology. I can spend 10 minutes explaining how a lighting system will work and then it's 45 minutes of looking at color patterns and color options for the actual switches and dimmers and wall plates. If you have a shopping list, if you say, I wanna use this brand of doorbell, I wanna use this brand of Wi-Fi, I like, I, I've already found this speaker I love, this, then it's gonna be harder to work with someone for that because everyone has their brands that they know or that they're familiar with. And there are a lot of equivalents at the 10,000 foot level. There's not a lot of differences. So if you have more of uh, what your spouse or partner of what you wanna do, I want great music for watching TV and streaming video. I want lighting that illuminates well, that keeps it bright, that can be adjustable, that can help set the mood. I want my shades to, to go up and down automatically without pulling on rods and strings. So if you think of it from a solution or problem solving need, and then you approach various professionals or consultants and see what they suggest. But if you go to them with a laundry list of your favorite brands, then you've really already engineered the solution. And I think the biggest value working with the right people is having them design it or engineer the solution then together you can pick products. If you go to someone and says, can you install brand X uh, audio video receiver for me? Can you install this lighting system? And they say, yes, yes, yes. Superficially, that's great. They wanna help, they wanna work with you, but do they really know it deep down inside? Do they live and breathe it every day? Do they have the technical support? Do they know where the bugs are, where the problems are? And so someone that's too willing to sell you what, or not sell you, but deploy whatever you want may not have enough knowledge or be able to help you when things don't work. And in our business, it's truthfully, it's not if they don't work, it's when they don't work. And I, I also think personally, I kind of view works with Apple HomeKit as more of the solution side. It's, it's not quite as high level strategy, but I think you could go to a lot of these people and say, I'm an Apple user, I wanna use Apple HomeKit for as much as possible, and they can work within that because they're hopefully some, some different brands to choose from. The appropriate thing to do, to go with a choice and say, I wanna be all HomeKit, or I wanna be all custom, or I wanna be all Sonos. That, that level is good, but not getting way down into the weeds. Although you mentioned a good point, I wanna bring up one question or one comment. Money is money, and I hate to say it. When you're spending real money, it's real money. But I've seen a real dislike of spending money for infrastructure. What I mean is running an ethernet wire from one end of your house to the other, through the ceiling or through the attic. You can hire an electrician or a cable installer, and let's say it costs 500 bucks. You do that once, your network is flawless forever. Instead of spending $500 or $200 to hire somebody to run a wire, Folks will spend $1,500 on fancy mesh gear and Wi-Fi gear and all this over-engineered technology that still isn't flawless because they don't have that wire or they don't have the, the wire for their thermostat. You know, hire a plumbing installer or a heating installer. You know, hire the tradesperson you need. It's a one-time fee. It's all the same money. So if you look at your total budget, maybe direct a little more to infrastructure and a little less to equipment in the beginning. Now, I'm not saying that to sell my services because I don't make, I'm not a tradesperson. I don't do the electrical, I don't do, so it's cost me money too when I do it. Look at it from that perspective. It's a different way of viewing things that is often brushed aside too quickly. Wow, that was just, that was really fun to sit down and talk with Robert. Now, I put Robert's information down below the like button in the description, so if you're interested in working with him, there's always that option, but man, I just learned a ton from that conversation. Now, one of the things that Robert was 
was talking about in there is infrastructure. And there's a key part of that that you might or might not understand yet, which is Thread and the role that Thread might play in your smart home. And I made a whole video interviewing a bunch of interesting people around the tech industry last year talking about Thread. So that video should be linked somewhere here on the screen if you haven't seen it already. Thanks again so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.